Well, good morning, church family. We're glad that you're joining us today. I invite you to stand as we begin our time together. As we come to the Lord, we come to Him to draw near, to listen to His word for us today. I invite you to let's come join Him in prayer. Lord, thank you that you are who you are. We can count on you. You reign and rule over all, no matter what is going on in the world around us. You will always be king, you will always be in charge. And we can always come to you. And so, Lord, because of what you've done for us, all that you have done, all that you are doing right now, we give you thanks. We give you praise. We give you glory for your awesome and mighty. And we worship you, our King of kings and Lord of lords. In your name we pray. Amen. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Let's sing to him. Great and
days that God has numbered I was made to walk with Him Yet I look for worldly treasure And forsake the King of Kings But mine is hope in my Redeemer Though I fall, His love is sure for Christ has paid for every failing I am His forevermore And mine are tears in times of sorrow Darkness not yet understood times of need I know my pain will not be wasted Christ completes his work in me mine are days here as a stranger pilgrim
Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name, for the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. Lord, we praise you and we thank you because you are good. Lord, you're so faithful. But I've just been reminded this week of how very much I have to be thankful for. Lord, our circumstances, our situations really don't matter when we know you. Lord, you're the game changer. You're the truth, the life. Lord, your way is the only way that produces joy and happiness. Lord, I thank you that it's your desire for each of us to live a full, a complete, an abundant life in you. And Lord, we just give you all the praise and thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning again. We're glad that you're here. Today at 11 o'clock, we've got children's ministry and the youth ministry and adult Sunday school. And uh, also, I hope you're going to join us on Wednesday night. We're going to be in the courtyard at 7 o'clock. We'll have the heaters and things out, but it's looking like it's going to be a, a nice evening. And it's just going to be a time for us to come together and give thanks to the Lord and not only share what we're grateful for, but to just, to just praise Him and be together. So I hope you'll be part of that. Also, we're going to be doing a Christmas festival on December 11th. That's a Saturday. We've secured the train that we used at Harvest, and they've got a number of things and stories and crafts and hot chocolate and a tree lighting. And it should be a great event for the community, an opportunity to share the love of Christ. And then what we're going to do is we're going to leave up all the decorations and things and come back the next day on the 12th, which is a Sunday, 
And then we'll have a time really for the church family where we can sing carols and our favorite Christmas hymns and be together and celebrate. So it should really be a great thing. Also a reminder that this month's leadership offering is this is Samaritan's Purse, and we're going to use that to help families, people all over the world. So it should be a great thing. So let's just turn our hearts to the Lord again in prayer. Lord, I do thank you for you are good. Lord, your loving kindness fills the earth. Lord, no one is like you, our great transcendent God. Who, Lord, before you even created this planet, you already had a plan, you already had a design for each of us. And I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that you would use your word, Lord, to touch and impact us today in all the ways you desire. We praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> You noticed how many companies advertise things that they really can't deliver? For example, I keep seeing these ads on TV. One company promises to reduce wrinkles and tighten the skin on your face and your neck. And they say if you use their product for just two weeks, you'll look 10 years younger. I can stay confident and cool throughout the day if I use the right deodorant. And a prominent home fitness company promises the results you want in just six weeks. There's a cruise line, I've actually been on it, that promises if I spend my vacation with them, I'll relax, renew, and come home new. Great news for people like my wife, buy a sleep number bed, and you'll not only sleep better than you've ever slept before, but you can remove the roar from your partner's snore. Here's a new one. When you're driving a Lincoln, stress seems to evaporate into thin air. And if I drink the right beer, beautiful people will be attracted to me, and on and on it goes. I mean, it seems to me that these and thousands of other companies have figured out that the most effective way to sell their products is by selling or marketing a given lifestyle. If you really think about it, they're actually selling a lifestyle as much as they are a product. And this approach is extremely effective. Do you know why? Because most people want to improve the quality of their lives. You know, they, they want to fill their lives with those things that they think will maximize their joy and minimize their unhappiness. And our, according to our society, the kinds of things I mentioned and many more are what you need in order to live a quality, fulfilling life. But the truth is they cannot deliver on what they promise. They may ease your comfort for a day or make you feel better for a moment, but they just cannot produce lasting joy and gratitude. However, the good news, and it really is good news, is that as Christians, you and I really do have the opportunity to live in a way that will maximize our joy and produce incredible, unrivaled quality in our daily lives. And in our text this morning, Paul's going to give us three keys to living that kind of life. So why don't you turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. We're going to focus on chapter 5 in a few minutes on a section that we looked at a few weeks ago briefly. But I want to give you just a, a couple little insights before we read this. You need to understand that, don't know how they got the message in there, how they infiltrated the church, but the people, the church at Thessalonica, had been told that Christ had already come. Now think about that for a minute. If somebody showed up at our church or in a Christian meeting that you attend and said, yeah, you know, Christ already came. How would you feel? What would you be thinking, right? You'd be all kinds of fear, dismay. Plus, there were other members of that church who feared that their loved ones who had died before Christ returned. Because remember, in the first church, they thought Christ was going to be back any minute. So they were fearful that those who had died before he came, it was too late for them. And so Paul addressed their concerns, and he explains how the Lord will come. We see this starting in verse 13. This is one of the most marvelous sections of Scripture, by the way. He says, but we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep. Now here, he's using the word asleep for death. So it's people who have died later in this section. You'll see he's using it for what we think of when we go to bed and sleep. He says, so that about those who have died, so that you will not grieve as the rest who have no hope. Because people that don't know Christ, you die that's kind of it, right? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have died in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. You know, we're not going to go first. 
For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. That's why we believe that when Christ returns at the second coming, all those who have died, they're going to be raised from their graves, from the dead. He says, verse 17, And then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And then in chapter 5, Paul shifts his focus away from how the Lord will come to what his coming means for his people. You know, what's the significance? Chapter 5, verse 1. Now, as to the times and the epochs, brother, in other words, you know, trying to figure out when he's going to come and, and what that may mean, you have no need of anything to be written to you. For you yourselves know full well that the day of the Lord will come just like in a thief in the night. It's going to come unexpectedly. It's just, it's going to happen. And while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor planes upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness that the day would overtake you like a thief. You know, we're not unaware. We're not unprepared. For you are all sons of light and sons of day. We are not of night nor of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us be alert and sober. Remember, we saw that before. We've got to be on alert. We've got to be paying attention. We've got to be constantly ready. For those who sleep do their sleeping at night, and those who get drunk get drunk at night. But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, you know, whether we're living or dead, we will live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build up one another just as you are also doing. Very encouraging words. Now look at verse 14. We urge you, brethren, admonish the unruly, you know, those in the church that are not doing what they should, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with everyone, see that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. And then he continues into verse 16. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Then verse 19. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything carefully. You know, that's one of the things we still need to be doing. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. You know, and so he's telling us that, you know, listen to God's word and obey it. You know, do those things. And then he can, kind of ends with this beautiful benediction. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he also will bring it to pass. You know, it's going to happen. Now, as you can see, this is a, a marvelous and powerful passage of Scripture, and we could spend a lot of time here. But this morning, I want to direct our focus on three of these verses that tell us how to live a quality life as we wait for our Lord's return. You know, these are the things we need to be occupying our time, our minds with, as we wait for Jesus to come back for us. Turn back to verse 16. It says, rejoice always. Pretty straightforward. And here we learn that the first key to living a quality life is to be joyful. And you need to understand, Paul is not calling for a joy that you can produce by your own efforts. I think it's natural for people to be happy when things are going well. But it's not this type of joy or more accurately happiness that's being called for. Because happiness is dependent on a person's circumstances, right? But the joy that Paul wants every Christian to experience is the joy that only comes from being united through faith in Jesus Christ. You see, Paul understood that those who belong to Jesus have uh, spiritual resources available to them that are so great, earthly things cannot disturb them. No one can take them away. We reviewed a number of those things in our recent study on the Christian armor. We kept going back to Ephesians 1, 3, where Paul talks about you know, how blessed we are because we have been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies. There are just numerous blessings and things that are, that are ours because we're in Christ. So that means we can and we should be living with joy 
in our hearts. I believe this is the reason the New Testament contains so many commands to live joyfully. I don't know if you've happened to notice that, but this is a, a recurring theme throughout the New Testament. I mean, actually, we are called to rejoice more than 70 times in the New Testament. So bottom line, rejoicing is not an optional feature of the Christian's life. If, to be blunt, it's actually a sin for you and I to not be joyful. When we're grumbling, when we're running around scared, when we're complaining, that's sin. Now, if we examine the early church, we can learn a great deal about true and lasting joy. You know, for the first Christians, persecution was a constant threat. Their lives were in constant danger. Not only did people want to kill them or beat them, drive them out of their cities, but if you happened to have been a, let's say you were a shop owner or what, they'd boycott you so you couldn't make a living, put you out of business, uh, they'd persecute them. I mean, they did all kinds of evil against them. And so these people often found themselves in difficult and trying situations. What's so insightful and fascinating is that rather than focusing on their circumstances, they chose to focus on the Lord. That's where their attention was. Moreover, they had learned to rejoice always in good times as well as the bad because they understood the benefits that come as a result of suffering. I know most of us seem to have a, a real aversion to suffering, and yet Jesus, our Lord, and the apostles, throughout the epistles, we see this exhortation, you know, on a about the importance of trials. We see how we're supposed to, James, you know, welcome them, you know, as lost friends kind of thing. And so I think that's one of those things with our aversion to pain and when we lose God's perspective, we, we try to avoid those things. But Scripture actually affirms them and, and tells us about just the many benefits that come to a person through trials and challenges. You know, they, first of all, they help us develop endurance, you know, sort of a real world face so we don't just kind of go up and down. They can produce good character and greater trust in God. I think one of the reasons God allows them is when you go through difficult things and you see how faithful God is, I mean, it's great. I love the fact we have scripture. But God also wants to write his own story in your life. He wants to show you firsthand how good he is, how faithful he is. You know, and so it's very helpful, of, actually, if we have the right perspective, to face those things and just see, wow, God is good. He's powerful. And so the, because of that, we really can rejoice always when we know and believe that our trials and testing will produce the virtues and the kind of character that God wants to build into us. And the early church understood this truth. So they thought more of their Lord than their difficulties. They thought more of their you know, spiritual riches in Christ than their poverty, more of their glorious future when Christ returned for them than whatever the present situation they were facing. And let me say this in a slightly different approach, but same kind of idea. You've got to understand, a note of joy rings throughout the New Testament. So Paul, who himself knew what it was like to rejoice in difficult circumstances, says rejoice always. I mean, think about who's saying this. We've talked about this before, all the beatings, the struggles, you know, all the things this guy endured. Remember we looked a few months ago at he and Silas, when they were out sharing the gospel, were wrongly arrested and beaten and thrown into jail, and they weren't sitting in there complaining and mad. They start worshiping and praising God. And remember, that's when the, you know, the chains fall off and the doors open, and, and God uses that to bring people to Christ. It was an incredible thing. So how do you and I learn to be joyful in any and every situation that comes our way? It's important information, isn't it? Well, I believe it, it begins by you and I choosing to fix our attention on the Lord and on eternity, rather than our circumstances or our pain or our suffering. I, th I think sometimes one of the things that really gets us in trouble is that instead of looking right away to God and going to him first, we, we start trying to, you know, engineer our way out of our circumstances or try to make sense of it. We try to do it on our own, but we're looking at the wrong things. I mean, you know, if your focus is on yourself or your circumstances, you're putting the emphasis on the wrong things. 
By the way, the New Testament does not, you know, describe Christians as being these poor people who always have to do unpleasant things in the service of their God. No. It portrays them as people who are glad, they're actually thankful to live out the implications of their faith in their daily lives. They thought it was an incredible privilege to, to suffer because they looked like Christ, because they were identified with him. Unlike us, and we're, we're upset and scared and all that. Not them. That was a badge of honor. That was an amazing thing for them. They were thankful. They were grateful for the opportunities, not only to serve the Lord, but to make their relationship with him known. And there's another aspect of this. I've said this before. I don't like it when especially in times like we've been going through, when Christians sort of stick their heads in the th sand or we're grumpy or we're negative. I mean, if you and I as believers in Jesus Christ can't be joyful when we're up against it, how are we any different than people who don't know God? If we're complaining about the same things and acting the same way, what kind of testimony is that? What kind of statement about God's sufficiency and goodness is that? You know, I tell you, one of the things I love so much about God is that his grace and his presence is so present when I'm struggling or hurting. It's like every time I go through something, I get hit with something, and then God just comes in, and it's, it's greater, and it's more, and I get, to, I get to experience more of him, and I get to experience different aspects of him. I mean, talk to Christians who have responded to adversity and pain by clinging to the Lord, and you know what they'll tell you? that they felt, they never felt closer to God when the, than they were when they were hurting, when they were afraid. Because he truly is the God of all comfort. No matter what you might be up against today or tomorrow, he knows exactly the best way to encourage you and to strengthen you and to love you. He's a good God. And, and there's another side to this. You know, God doesn't want your testimony to be Wow, I trusted God. I went all in and my world just fell apart. It was horrible. That's not what he's looking for. That's not what he wants for you. Now look at verse 17. He says, pray without ceasing. This is the one that we looked at. And what we see is that the second key to living a quality life is you've got to be committed to prayer. You've got to be prayerful. And as we learn in our study of the Christian's armor, a personal relationship with the living God enables us to turn our thoughts away from ourselves and the source of our pain and on to him who has done incredible things for us in Christ. And here's the important part. As we live in that reality, truly understanding what God has done, as we, I'm really excited for Advent this year. It's just been impacting me more than I can remember. Just this idea that how, you know, really before this world was even formed, God planned for you. He knew you. He knew these things he was going to do. And when I think about God coming and becoming one of us and all that he was going to endure for us, it's incredible. It's so powerful. And it, it should be moving our hearts. It should be encouraging us and strengthening us. And so when we understand what God has done and what he continues to do on our behalf, then one of the things that should happen is that we will be able to lean on him instead of ourselves in any situation that comes our way. It doesn't really matter what it is. Our first step is always to God. We always go right to him, not, well, how can I figure this out or what do I need to do? No, I move right to him. Now, let me review a couple other things for you. The heart of the gospel message is the inability of sinners to bring about their own salvation or to live in a way that God approves of without his help. The truth is, and I, I know this flies right in the face of our self-made men and women things of today and all this, you know, do your own thing and all that. It, you can tell that's another one of those deceits we saw that Satan foists upon humankind. Because we are always going to be dependent on God. So Paul calls, you know, Paul's call for constant or continual prayer one of the things it's intended to do is remind us that we lack the power in and of ourselves to live rightly and have a quality life apart from God. See, Paul knew the Thessalonians, like all Christians, are dependent on God for everything. That's the truth. 
He also understood that this continual prayer was the best way for us to acknowledge and express our dependence to the Lord. You know, when I constantly go to the Lord and go, hey, there's this situation over here. I don't know how to handle it. Lord, I'm in deep water. I don't know how to get out of this. I don't know how to talk to this person or work here. You know, it does two things. One, it honors God. But the other thing is it keeps reminding me is you're not that powerful. You don't have all the answers. And it activates God's power and strength in my life. And so as Christians, we should constantly be aware of our dependence on the Lord and the fact, there's another thing I want to throw in here. The fact that you're always going to be the object of his love. God longs to love us, to embrace us, to show us his love. And, and when we go off trying to do our own thing and sometimes, oh, where's God? Why didn't go to this? We're, go, we're going the wrong direction. He's a good God. He's a loving God. And he wants to fill us with himself. And so, you know, as I'm facing these challenges, I've got to keep reminding myself, and God loves me. God is for me. God is with me. And even though you and I are unable to live a quality life on our own, and this is probably the most important thing I'll tell you this morning, and we are unable to do that, remember, you and I have incredible resources. You know, in other words, is we have all the resources that we need to live an abundant life available to us in Christ. We've, we've studied that for 10 weeks. Everything you and I could ever need has been made available to us. And so that knowledge, if you really, you know, we, last week we, we've been separating sort of the wheat and the chaff. If you really believe that, if you really know your God, you really believe those truths, it should cause us to rejoice always. You know, why, I mean, why should we do otherwise? Tell you, one of the big things for me that, that's helped me stop being upset and angry by things in our, I see going on in our nation is I stopped focusing on those circumstances. I started focusing on Christ. I know how he's going to deal with these issues. I don't know when, but see, because I know him, I know his character, I know his nature, I know he's good, I know he's always going to do the right and the best thing. I don't need to try and carry things I was never created and, and had the power to carry on my own in the first place. That's a myth. But see, that's not all. That knowledge should keep us on our knees in constant prayer. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. All different ways of praying, all different postures, all different kinds of things. Sometimes I'm praying, I'm offering up prayers of thanksgiving and gratitude. Sometimes I'm interceding and I'm praying for someone's health or for God to intervene in this situation or for a friend or a neighbor, somebody to come to Christ. All kinds of prayers. But see, let me try to phrase it this way. You know, if, I, if I'm growing in God, I know God, I have that relationship, we should want to talk to our Father who loves us about everything. The first move isn't to call Candace or my sister or a loved one or Doug. It's, it's Him. That's where I go first. That's where I need to go first. Because no one loves me like He does. And it's interesting, as I was thinking about this, I've discovered that Prayer and rejoicing are closely related. You know, if I'm having a hard time or stuff's coming at me, you know, it's amazing if I go into God's presence and I'll sit there and let him lead me, when I start praising him and thanking him, it's like everything just sort of flips. Does that mean all my problems just vaporize? No. But I have a different perspective. It, you know, it changes me. That's what prayer does ultimately. It changes me. It changes my perspective. The other thing that I find that happens when I go to God in those times, many times he's going to show me things in my mind, in my heart, in my attitude that are wrong or incorrect or things that have become a hindrance or a barrier to my relationship with him and my joy. That's what he'll do is you're in his presence. Many times you'll start to see, oh my gosh, I've been doing too much of this over here, not enough of this there. there and sometimes I find, oh my gosh, because I've been praying and I thought I was going, doing the, I started out good. How did I suddenly take this thing over? How did I pull it out of his hands and trying to work it out on my own? And so in those times, he, so often he'll just show me, I love you, but son, you got the wrong attitude. You got the wrong perspective. You, there's some changes needed here. Let me share something powerful with you that one of the great writers of prayer, E.M. Bounds, wrote. I just love this description. 
Prayer is no petty invention of man, a fancied relief for fancied ills. Prayer is the contact of a living soul with the living God. Prayer fills man's emptiness with God's fullness. It fills man's poverty with God's riches. It, put, it puts man's weakness together with God's strength. It banishes man's littleness with God's greatness. Prayer is God's plan to supply man's great and continuous need with God's great and continued, continuous advancement and abundance. And then the last thing he said, this one just, just gripped my heart. He said, prayer is the outstretched arms of the child for the father's help. See, prayer also provides us with an excellent opportunity to express our praise and our desire to be part of what God's doing in the world. And so often when I go into his presence in the morning, I just want to be with him. I find myself, I'll read a scripture or something, you know, whom shall I send? And Lord, okay, I'll go. I want to go. Lord, I want to be part of your redemptive plan for San Mateo. I want to be part of the community. I want to, you know, I keep praying. I want to do your will, not mine. I want to join you. I want to be part of you and what you want to do, God. And in a, in a very real sense, prayer is a response to the reality of God's presence in our lives. I'm there with him, and suddenly he speaks. He, you know, hearkens a word. He illuminates a passage of Scripture, whatever it may be. And, I'm, and I just become acutely aware of, and he's there. He's there in real and tangible ways. And then that helps me see it, no matter what I'm going through, even when I'm really, because when you're, remember when you're in pain, sometimes it's hard to see clearly, Right? When I get into that contact with him, suddenly I realize, you're here. You love me. You're for me. And I, I think I'm going to say this for all of us. No matter where you may happen to be in your Christian life, I think we all need to learn to become more conscious of God and his presence. You've got to understand something. I, I tried to make this clear a couple weeks ago with the armor, but you've got to understand, as Christians, as the people of God, Prayer is central to all that we are and all that we do. A, a non-praying Christian is, is an oxymoron. Or someone that just keeps reciting the same things over, parroting stuff. That's not prayer. Jesus told us that very clearly. Prayer is at the core. It's, you know, it's that connection. So when Paul instructs us to pray without ceasing, remember, he isn't telling us to spend every waking moment speaking audibly to God. As we learned a couple of weeks ago, what Paul is saying is that our minds need to constantly be thinking about God and focusing on him. For some of us, we like to go for walks, and that's just, that's a place where I fellowship with him. And, or through, I told you, throughout the day, I'll stop at, get, get, at different times and just think, man, I'm just so glad that God loves me. God, I'm so thankful for, you know, you got me safely from point A to point B. I'm so glad that I'm in your life. I'm so glad for my salvation. I'm just so thankful I get to be part of you. You know, what I'm saying is we, we're, we have this constant awareness of God's activity in our lives. I told you, I, when I started getting really upset, especially about the political and national stuff going on, when God started to open my eyes, I had so many things to thank him for. And I could, and I could see, and I kept getting this sense from him of just watch what I'm doing. And, and I'm seeing it unfold. He's working. He's involved. And see, when we surrender ourselves wholly to God and we recognize that we are totally and completely dependent on him, whether words are spoken or not, we're continually lifting our hearts to the Lord. We're thinking about him and we start living in the reality that his presence with all, is always with us. There's nowhere, David talked about, there's nowhere that I can go to escape God's presence. He's always with me. And, there, and I'll be honest, and there are times in my life when I'm really hurting, when things seem overly dark, and I have to, go, by faith, believe that he's there. Because maybe I'm not feeling it today. Maybe I am struggling today. That's going to happen. That's real. That happens to people that love Jesus. It does. That's the truth. Now look at verse 18. In everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Now here we see that the third key to living a quality life is to be thankful. One of the things that I often comes into my mind, how do you think someone who doesn't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ is dealing with the ebb and flow of life these days? 
How do they deal with all the stuff we've endured? How do they deal with illness, with pain, with their fear, with the loss of loved ones? I've said this to you over and over again, and it's still true. I just honestly do not know how you could be living in this world today apart from him and just not just turn to drugs, alcohol, lose your mind, whatever. I understand the, the things that I see in people today, the fears, the angers, because apart from Christ, there is no hope. I just, and I think back to before I really knew him the way I do now, and I think, Lord, it was just pure grace that you kept me going. Because it's, there, there's little to hope for in, in, in just in the natural. And it's been my experience that non-Christians, like all people, face various things in life. Some of those things make them happy for a season. Others make them angry or sad. You know, and they tend to interpret the various things that happen in their lives as being caused more or less by fate or chance. Oh, that's just random. That's just what happens. That's just the way it is. You know, they don't understand that there is this incredible being that's in charge of everything. And of course, they like those things that suit their purposes and they complain about those things that don't. But see, here's the, here's the difference maker. This is the thing that should be affecting you and me. When a person comes into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, it should change every single aspect of your life. If not, something's wrong. Especially the way we interpret and view our circumstances. I can't just see them as, I don't even use the word chance. I don't believe in chance. I don't believe in fate. Things don't just kind of happen randomly. But see, you and I, we should know better. So no matter what's going on, no matter what you're dealing with, we need to put God in the center of it. See, and here's the thing, even during trials and difficulties, it should be apparent to us that God's purposes, his sovereign purposes are being worked out. And I'm gonna tell you something, the evidence of that will become clear to you over time. In times we, you know, the, initially we don't see how God's working. We don't put all those pieces together. We don't understand. I, 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 illustration just popped into my head. It would have been two years ago in October. Candace and I had just come back from a three-week trip. She worked in Daly City. She'd gotten in, she had her nice little routine going, 20, 25-minute commute each way. And she came back, went into work that Monday and found out that either her or her coworker was going to be transferred to San Jose. Whoever lived closest was how they were going to make the decision. And her coworker lied, and even though she lived in Redwood City, said she lived in Milpitas. So in a matter of a couple days, Candace got transferred to San Jose. And her commute tripled. Some days it was two hours each way. And it was hard, and it was difficult, and all these things went on. And the truth is, she wasn't real happy about it. She would tell herself her perspective was not probably where it should have been. Little did we know a couple months later, if she'd have stayed where she was, she'd have lost her job. Little did she know that this was going to open the door for her to work remotely and bring just great, wonderful changes. But initially, God, what are you doing? I thought you loved me. God, please don't let me get trained. You know, we do, all of us do those very things. It's going to take time, but time always proves God's way was the best way. It was the right way. Sometimes we want to grab this thing right here and God's going, no, that's not the best I have for you. Wait, hang in there. Time always proves he knew best. And that leads me to share this principle, that God's loving purposes are being worked out even in those events that you are not likely to welcome or to want. But as you come to know, to believe, when you understand that God is actively involved in every single aspect of your life, you can learn to always give thanks in everything. And sometimes that's gonna be by faith. Because you may not see the evidence yet, but you know, see that's why I keep talking about it. It's so important that you know him. Prayer, the word, the, you, know, you know his nature, you know his character. So you may not be able to pinpoint, okay, he's gonna do exactly this, but you know him. And there's this beautiful track record that we have recorded in Scripture that tells us this is who he is, this is how he functions. And so we can give thanks in everything, even trials. Listen, I know firsthand that trials 
aren't fun, that they can be really unpleasant. And yet, in the midst of them, we should give thanks knowing that the Father who loves us so much has permitted them so that his wise and merciful purposes might be worked out through them. Now, I need to make a little point here. This came up in a class I'm teaching last week. If you are the effective cause for your problem, <laughs> if you are the source of what you are suffering, if you kind of, you know, you understand what I'm saying? That's on you. Generally speaking, when you and I are living our lives and we're trying to connect to God and we're trying to do things God's way and bad things happen and challenges and hurts and all that stuff comes, because it, that's just, Jesus told us that would happen. What I'm able to do is say, okay, Lord, you know, I don't like this, but I know you're in control. So, Lord, show me how I can glorify you in this. Show me how you want me to respond to this thing over here or how I can best represent you wherever you place me in this kind of a situation. Lord, bring glory to yourself. And Lord, help me to have the right perspective and attitude so I don't bring you know, shame on you. Because you've got to understand something. God allows difficulties and hardships to come into our lives, not to hurt us, but to improve us, to refine us, and to help us. You know, anything, we saw this in the Christian's armor, anything that hits you has to first go through him. But again, if I'm not putting on the armor, if I'm not going God's way, then you are kind of said, remember, you said, I don't need you, God. I'll, let, me, let me try to work this out on my own. That's the problem. So often we try to do it our way until we're already in deep weeds and hurting, and then we're upset that God let it happen. But he's going to give you a lot of freedom. And so when trials and difficulties come, that's why I said one of the first things I need to ask is, Lord, what are you trying to teach me through this? What do you want me to understand in this? Let me share something powerful that, that Charles Stanley wrote regarding this. He said, sometimes giving thanks may be the last thing you want to do. There are challenges you face that are so negative and painful that they affect every aspect of your life, stealing your joy and taking your focus away from God. But if you will ask the Father to make you thankful, he will. If you tell God you want to praise him in the midst of your difficulties, he will bring blessings to mind and change your focus. Why? Because God wants to help you honor his commands and reveal his good purposes in your circumstances. Though your, earth, your trials may seem to be impeding your progress from your earthly perspective, God will show you how he is actually accomplishing great goals through them, like growing your faith. So ask the Father to make you thankful today and voice your gratitude to him. You'll find that when you take your eyes off your problems and focus on him, the challenges you face don't seem so overwhelming anymore. You'll also realize he's already given you the victory. That's the truth. Now, to a great extent, I think that learning to be thankful in everything is a direct result of having a correct and biblical understanding of God and eternity. Again, I don't know if you keep seeing this pattern. If you don't have a biblical understanding of God, if you don't see, in other words, if you don't see God as God has revealed himself to be in Scripture, you're going to be judging God. You're going to be evaluating. And this other thing, and this is something we keep coming back to. You know, we, yeah, we want to be used by God. We want to be available to God in this life, but we cannot ever take our eyes off eternity, on the life that is to come. We've said this many times because this present life, really, it's just boot camp. It's preparation for the life to come. How we live, how we serve God, where we live, what we have is all going to be dependent on what we did now. Listen to what G.I. Packer says. Eschatology, which, you know, is the study of the last things, is the clue to understanding the nature of the Christian life. That life is essentially a life of hope, a life in which nothing is perfect yet, but the hope of perfection is set before us, so that we may forget what is behind and reach out to what lies ahead and press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. One of the things we modern Christians are very bad at, it seems to me, is remembering what the whole materialistic culture around us encourages us to forget. That there are two worlds, not just one. You will live two lives, not just one. And heaven really is more important than earth. For heaven's life is the goal for which this life is preparation. You know, our future is we are going to be with God forever. We're going to be in a place that's nothing like this one. But in the meantime, 
You know, there's some rough edges that need to be sanded down and shaped, reshaped and changed. And one of the tremendous benefits of knowing who God is and thinking rightly about him is it's going to give you this firm foundation for life. We talked about, you know, that in the armor too. When I think rightly about God, when my understanding of who he is lines up with who he says he is, I'm building my life on a wreck. I'm not going to be, every time I hear a new news report or something happens in the family, oh, this, oh, that. And, and what most of us try to do is we compensate. Oh, it happens all the time to Doug and I. People come in, you know, Pastor, I trust God. I'm trusting God. And then it's just, Pfft. and it's like, are you listening to yourself? Because you tell me you trust God over here, but everything you're doing over there says you don't. And that produces cognitive dissonance. What you think you believe is not what you're doing. Happens to us all the time, right? But see, that's what's been helping me so much this past year. I start looking at God, who he is, his history, before I ever start looking at what's going on in my life and how I'm seeing things. I look at him. And I realized Jesus was not kidding. He's like, you know, I'm building my life on a firm foundation. It doesn't matter what winds and rain come at it. I'm not going to get tossed to and fro by all these false things. So again, I'm going to ask, you know, are you regularly making time to just to reflect and think about who God is and what that means for your life? You think about who's on your side, who loves you most, who's with you. Have you thought about this, but it, what I'm going to tell you is true. Do you, do you understand that your knowledge or view of God shapes every one of your beliefs, all of your decisions, and everything that you do? Tozier talked about that in Knowledge of the Holy, great book. But how you see God, if it's not right, if it's not in line with what God has revealed in Scripture, it, it, it affects everything. You know, one when, when way to say it, I was reading this the other day. If you, have a, if you have a big God, in other words, if your God is the God of Scripture, every problem you face is small in comparison. If you have a small God, or you have a, then you have big problems. If your God is sort of nonchalant and uncommitted, you got problems. If your God, if you got to appease him to get him to work your way or to help you, you got problems. But when we think rightly about God, again, it, it, I don't have the answer to every issue, to every question, but I know him. I know his nature. I know his character. And I know that there's no evidence of him ever doing something that wasn't best for his people in the long run. It's just not who he is. Again, when we start thinking about it, when you think about what Christ did in becoming man, and you follow that life all the way up to the beatings, discouraging, I mean, he had all the power to do anything to stop it. He endured it. When I started thinking more and more about God and what Christ is like and his humility and how good he is and how loving he is, then what, and even if they killed me, and that just hastens, I'm now with Jesus, that's a great thing. Sometimes you get older. I've got friends that are facing real issues and significant things, and they may well die soon. They're not bummed out. They're not upset because they're just, they realize, okay, well, yeah, that's good. I got to be with Jesus sooner. Now, before we close, I want to share something with you. I think this is really important. As I was studying these, this passage this week, I discovered something that I found to be very important, very significant. And it is this. All three of these principles that I've shared with you, these verses 16 through 18, they all come from the same Greek root word. You say, well, it's a big deal. Well, that's really important. Because what that means is that we must view them as a unity. They're connected. See, what I'm saying is they are interdependent. What I'm saying is they don't represent three separate principles like I've shared with you today or three separate commands or three different attitudes towards the Christian life. No. 
they embody three aspects of one and the same attitude. And Paul tells us here that it is this attitude, I don't know if you caught this at the end of verse 18, he says, this is God's will for every Christian. I wish I had a dollar for every time someone came to me and said, I wish I knew what God's will is. Well, here's one of the places it tells you. So did you happen to catch it? Did you notice it? Do you know what it is? Paul's saying, as Christians, you and I are commanded. This isn't, hey, if you feel like it. This is a command. You and I are commanded and we are expected by God to maintain an attitude of gratitude and thanksgiving throughout our lives as we go through each day. Come what may, we need to be people that are grateful and we're thankful. Again, to me, this is one of the great distinctives of really knowing God. In a time such as this, if you're a person that has joy and peace and is grateful and thankful, people are going to want to know what you're on or what you're doing. Because that is so distinct from even many professed Christians, what they really experience in their daily lives. I mean, I'm so dismayed by the, the, the incredibly fast decline of our culture. What did Abraham Lincoln or Thomas Jefferson do that their statues should be torn down and, you know, they should be removed from all the history books? Because we now have the, the cancel culture and with that and all this anger and fear mongering this out there, there's just... No lack of gratitude and thanksgiving. People that I know and myself, when you've traveled a lot, do we have problems? As Muhammad Ali said, you got problems? Yeah, we got problems. We're still the greatest country in the world. Travel the world. Talk to friends and people that live in other places. I don't care what part of the world they're in. No one has the freedom, even, even though they're trying to steal that and do the things they're doing, that we have. I don't know about you. I'm so thankful I was born here. I'm not trying to be arrogant about that, but I'm thankful. But look what's going on. It's our society. We no longer, we're not thankful for the benefits we've received and enjoyed. And said, you've got that. I don't think you should have it, or I don't like this, or I don't like that. I'm going to sue you. I'm going to fight you. I'm going to pick you on. I'm going to cancel you. I'm going to do whatever. You know, now instead of being grateful for things, it's, I have a right. I demand this. This is my opinion. And if you disagree with me, you're a racist or you're this or you're that. You're canceled. And as Christians, we need to be very, very careful that we do not become infected and thus influenced by these trends that are taking place in our nation. Or else it will most likely adversely affect your own relationship with the Lord. You'll start exerting your rights rather than his lordship. Now look, I think we could all agree <laughs> the past 21, 22 months have been really, really tough. I doubt any of us have ever lived through anything like this. You think about initially, you know, the result of the pandemic, we had, we, you know, because of that, we had to endure shelter and place orders and Businesses and schools were shut down even now, you know. I don't know if you heard this one. This one actually made me laugh that in one particular school district, they've decided that there should not be school on Fridays because it's better for the virus. And I'm like, oh, okay. That's a smooth one for teachers to have an extra day off a week. But look at all the stuff we endured. And then there was the political scene and all the social unrest and all the crazy stuff. What's the truth about that? If you're paying attention, it started to come out now what that was all about. That was money, by the way, if you didn't know. But currently now we have to deal with vax mandates. We have people in our church that have been good employees that are on the verge of losing their jobs. They don't get the jab. The debacle in Afghanistan. You realize there's probably close to 1,500 Americans still stuck in Afghanistan? CRT? The border crisis, you see the results that came out on Thursday about the number of Americans that have overdosed? It's almost 200,000 people so far this year because of the fentanyl is laced in all these things. Borders wide open. 
How about this one? Pornography is now being taught in many public schools to children. Unspeakable things. Record high inflation, soaring food and gas prices. Your Thanksgiving dinner is going to cost about 23% more this year than last. And now the Build Back Better bill that will pretty much destroy things. God doesn't intervene. So let me ask. As the Thanksgiving holiday approaches, do you find yourself filled with gratitude and thanksgiving despite our current situation? Are you able to praise God and thank him for all that he is, for all that he has done? You should be able to. Because, I mean, saints, the truth is, as Chris, by God's people, by definition, should be thankful. It's part of our heritage. It's part of what we're supposed to be. That we can sing the Lord's song in a tough world, in a foreign land, in difficult situations, because we have so much to be thankful for. Because I don't know about you, but the things I'm counting on are not earthly things. It's not earthly people. And so, and here's the thing, when you begin to really know God and understand who he really is and all that he's already done and all he's going to do, how can you not be a person whose response is one of thankfulness and joy? We really understand what God has done for us in Christ. How can we be grumps? How can we be negative? How can we be doomsayers and just scared of this? And for, you know, the word worry shouldn't even be in a Christian's vocabulary, folks. There's nothing for us to fear. I mean, think about the many blessings and benefits that are yours just because you're his child. That's the game changer. Let me share something that Sacred Script Ministries put out on Thanksgiving. Thankfulness is more than reflecting on all the good things that happen in your life. Thankfulness is always the mature believer's response to growing in his or her faith because of the work of Jesus Christ. If your year was tough and you don't feel thankful... Ground yourself in the truth by reviewing what Jesus has done for you. He's taken the punishment for your sins on the cross and clothed you with his righteousness. He has given you everlasting and abundant life through the work of his spirit. No matter what this life brings, we are safe and secure in our salvation. We have so much to be thankful for this year. It's just the truth. We do. We have so much to be thankful for. So again, is your life characterized by joy? by gratitude and thanksgiving. When people observe your life, and they do, especially when you claim to know God, can they see clear evidence of gratitude and thanksgiving? You know, this week, as I was just thinking about this idea of you know, having a quality life and always giving thanks, I realized something. Thankfulness depends on what's in your heart, not what's in your hand or your checkbook. And see, it's knowing God that gives us the right perspective. I remember I talked about that when was, we began this last study. It gives me this lens so I can look at what's going on and I can see it through Christ. There was a thing that I shared with you recently that I'd read in Kenneth Boa that I keep revisiting. And he talks about, you know, that we need to see our circumstances in light of Christ, in light of who God is and what he's done. But more often than not, what we do is we look at God in light of our circumstances. Do you see the difference there, the nuance? It's big. I need to see everything that's coming with who's really on control. I, I just finished the Minor Prophets, and it's like, man, God doesn't miss a beat. This king, this person's in power. You can put in the names of nations today. They're there because God allowed them to be there. And when they, he says they're done, they're done. He's the one calling the shots. And see, the more I spend in his word and the more I take what I'm feeling, and, and, and listen, you're going to feel these things and you're going to have these thoughts. I'm not saying that's wrong. But what do you do with them? Take them to him. Interpret them in light of what God has said and who God is. Suddenly, guess what? This stuff just, okay. Lord, I can't wait to see what you do next. I can't wait to see how you work because you are a God of truth and justice. And see, I honestly believe that being thankful allows me to see things as they really are. 
instead of the way I have imagined to perceive them. Because I got to be honest, more often than not, I'm wrong. I completely misread it. I don't know why, but you know, we don't, most of us don't seem to go to the positive, the most positive outcome first. We immediately, we hear something and, and we start planning why it's going to be terrible or why this thing is going to go wrong or this change. Oh, we got to hear, there's going to be a change at work and immediately go, oh, that's going to be great. It's, oh no, I'm going to lose my job or this thing's, oh, I'm going to have my, you know. Why do we do that to ourselves? So if you want to improve the quality of your life, you want to live the life Christ died so that you could live, it, it begins by humbly recognizing the many wonderful things God has done, continues to do on your behalf, and then responding rightly to him and his goodness. And I say, let's be people who not only have as an integral part of our lives praise unto God, but a desire to bless his holy name for all that he is, for all that he's done, and for all that he promises he's going to do in the future. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you are good, that you are faithful. Lord, you have ordered and created things in such a way that, Lord, we really can, we honestly can find joy no matter what happens to be going on around us. Lord, the difference is when the joy is in you because you've promised you're never going to leave us, you're never going to forsake us, that you are going to finish what you've begun. Lord, I pray that your truths would drown out the things we read about or hear on the news. That we would recognize just how privileged we are because you are our God and our King. Lord, I pray that you would just tune our hearts to sing your praise as never before this year. To give you thanks for, Lord, it's all yours. You're worthy of it all. And we praise you. Amen.
place this morning. Join us for Bible study and uh, adult study, children's youth. Come back and join us on Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, for a great time of worship and Thanksgiving Eve together.